Welcome to a special edition of Savage Marriage with Phil and Priscilla. And I'm Phil. And I'm Priscilla. You'll be listening to Phil and I read our award-winning book, Savage Marriage, Triumph Over Betrayal and Sexual Addiction. We're releasing the audio version of our book for free, chapter by chapter, every few weeks on this podcast. If you've benefited from our ministry, share this podcast with someone else. You'll be glad you did. And here we go. Chapter 6, Confessing Secret Sins One who conceals his wrongdoings will not prosper, but one who confesses and abandons them will find compassion. Proverbs 28, 13 No Christian, if he is right with God, should ever need to hide anything in his life. A. W. Tozer I got up early on Wednesday, and almost immediately my mind went from slumber to high alert as my impending confession took front stage. I shuffled into the kitchen, sat down at the table, and opened my Bible and journal. Michael and Chelsea would be joining us for dinner, and I planned to open my heart to them. God, help me know what to say and how to say it. I need transparent words that will rip off the mask I've been wearing and expose my genuine spiritual brokenness. Please give me the humility I need. Michael was our thirdborn and had occupied the position as our youngest child for most of his life. A 13-year gap stood between him and Anna Hope. Michael was unpretentious and unworried about what people thought of him, qualities I should have embraced in myself but hadn't. He was quick to include the down and outers in his circle of influence and had no problem letting people see his weaknesses. Michael had been open with me about his porn struggles, but I had not been open with him. When the topic of his struggles had occasionally come up, I had encouraged him to stay pure and trust God to always provide a way for him to escape sexual temptations. My pride and shame, hiding my porn problem, had stood in the way of Michael seeing the real me. In my teen years, struggling with porn, I had been him. But as his dad, I'd led him to believe I was a true overcomer and that my problems were many years in the past. I had thought if Michael saw me as almost perfect, that image would encourage him not to give in to the temptations of sexual immorality as I had. Having Chelsea with us for my confession was a bit of a wild card, but Priscilla and I thought she'd want to be invited to this moment of truth as Michael's fiance. She was a strong woman, and I knew she'd help Michael process his emotions. They would be married in about 30 days, so the timing wasn't ideal, but it was the best I could do. It was past time, to be honest, and there would never be a good time to shatter my children's image of me. I couldn't put off this confession until after their wedding. Rather than wing it and inadvertently overlook something, I decided it was best to write out my confession, and I wanted Priscilla to vet what I was planning to say. I scripted ten points, followed by a request for forgiveness. I heard footsteps and a short good morning as Priscilla sat down at the table. Seeing how much I'd written in my journal, she asked, What are you doing? I decided to write out my confession to Michael and Chelsea. Would you like to read it? I want to make sure you believe I've covered everything. Sure, I'll read it. Let me grab my coffee. I hadn't slept well and needed a jolt of caffeine to clear my foggy mind. I was intrigued with Phil's mission to confess to our children. He had always projected himself with strength and confidence and arrogance, never disclosing weaknesses or failures. Now our kids would finally see their real dad, so I expected he would take his time lining up his confessions. When I settled into the chair and sipped my coffee, Phil handed me his journal. I read his ten points, expecting his confession would be honest but somehow result in him saving face. Instead, the confession was raw, authentic, honest, open, and transparent. As I read each point, my coffee forgotten. I realized how much God had done in his life in a matter of days. Phil was genuinely off his high horse and walking in humility, preparing himself to take a huge, difficult, and very important step to walk humbly before his kids. Laid out in black and white was the truth of who he was and how he had fallen short as a husband and father. 
My heart ached for Michael and Chelsea and what was to come that evening. They were living a starry-eyed dream, their wedding only weeks away, and Phil's words were going to wake them up with a jolt. But it had to be done. There was no other way. Looking up from the journal, I said, You covered everything. It's really good. Thanks. How do you think they'll react? I think they'll be shocked, and Michael will be really hurt. Phil glanced down, nodding, his face contorting with raw emotions. Boy, this is truly a different Phil. He's never let something affect him this deeply. As the day passed, my mind kept going back to the journal and what I've read. Even if Phil wanted to somehow contain the story after his forthcoming confession, there would be no way. After confessing to Michael and Chelsea, he would confess to our other kids, which created a tug of war inside me. Part of me wanted Phil to walk out the confession, take the first step in telling someone close to his heart other than me. The other part of me felt apprehensive as I wondered how each of our children would react. What would they say? Would they reject Phil? Would they reject me? We had both been such hypocrites. Evening came, and I heard Chelsea walk in with a bubbly, Hi, I'm here, and I'm hungry. Phil, Michael, and I were in the kitchen busying ourselves with last-minute dinner preparations. As we gathered around the table, I thought, Chelsea and Michael are so happy together and in love. Thirty days before their big day, and here we are about to pour cold water on their parade. Dear Jesus, give us the right words to say, You are here, Lord. After finishing the family dinner and the conversation, we asked Anna Hope and Becca to go upstairs and give us some time along with Chelsea and Michael. The girls scooted out and the lively chit-chat about the day ended. As I looked at our two young adults with their whole lives ahead of them, a somber look settled on their faces, as if they already had an idea of what we wanted to talk about. Phil opened his journal to the marked page and took a deep breath. His face was drawn with tension, knowing that his confession was about to forever change his children's lives and ours. His breathing became rapid, and he bit his lip, signs he was going to say something he didn't want to say. He finally got out the first words. Mom and I asked both of you to be here because I need to share something with you. I know you're getting married next month, but this isn't something I can put off. Michael and Chelsea shifted uncomfortably. Sure, what is it, Michael said, leaning forward in his chair. Chelsea remained still, looking pensively toward me, but saying nothing. I've written out what I want to say, not to be formal, but to be complete. With that short introduction, I began to read. I defrauded and betrayed your mother by committing adultery with prostitutes and entertaining sexual fantasies about other women while I viewed and masturbated to pornography. I have not led our family in truth. I lied and deceived you, all to make myself look better than I was. I refused to be humble, but instead chose to walk in pride and hypocrisy. I pushed you, Michael, to remain pure and control your sexual urges while I was not controlling mine. I felt unable to be transparent to confess my sins to you, even when you were transparent with me in disclosing your struggles. I appeared stronger and more righteous than you, but it's all been a lie. My sin allowed a stronghold into our family and your life that created distance between you and me. I didn't model the transparency God wants for us. My lack of transparency is what led me to live a secret life. My actions may have also planted a seed of secrecy in your life because I failed in this aspect of being the spiritual leader God wanted me to be. I push you to achieve and always look good because those made me look good. I pushed you so I could continue to cover the shame of my sin. Consequently, I led a life full of hypocrisy, desiring the admiration of others and using you to get there, without your knowledge and without regard for how my sin and secrecy 
was affecting you or making you feel. I pursued an outwardly religious life to make me look good and encourage you to do the same. I refused to be transparent about my life. While transparency could have helped you, I was too proud to admit my failures. I didn't push myself to engage with you, even when I thought you may be struggling. I was more focused on protecting and hiding my secret thoughts and actions than pursuing transparency that could have resulted in your deliverance and freedom from sin. My pride led me to elevate myself by showing a command of biblical knowledge and doctrine. I created a false impression of myself and reduced my true effectiveness as a husband, father, and spiritual leader. I coveted a material lifestyle and placed importance on how much money I could accumulate rather than demonstrating a humble life and being content with what I had. I repeatedly chose actions and paths resulting from pride rather than following a path of dying to self. I reinforced setting up barriers and fences to manage my sin rather than being humble, transparent, and willing to die to self. Overall, Michael, I've not been the father I should have been to you. I was more focused on my lust than on you, and I was wrong. I failed to protect and lead you, a son God gave me. And I humbly ask your forgiveness and your permission to re-engage with you as the father God desires you to have. I closed my journal and waited for Michael's response. For the past year, I'd been going to a sexual addiction recovery group at our church. While Dad was reading his confession, I felt as though I was back in my addiction group, simply listening to another broken man's story. Because of my own addiction, I was very stoic as he read, and I simply absorbed everything I could. When he finished his confession, he looked across the table at me and Chelsea, and then asked how I was feeling. I was honest as my emotions began to surface. This isn't group. This is real life, and it's happening to me. My voice rose as I tried to coherently explain to my dad how his confession was affecting me. About 65% of me is so proud of you for sharing with us, I said while emphatically hitting the table. But the other 35% is angry because you didn't share this with me earlier. Where was this confession 12 to 15 years ago? My whole life I believed you were Superman. Logically, I knew you weren't. But I wanted you to take off your suit and show me who you really were on the inside. I'd always felt like my dad presented himself as someone who had struggled with porn earlier in life but had beaten it. Like an experienced general, he had stood behind the front lines and directed young soldiers like me around the enemy. I thought if he had fought and beaten his porn addiction, I should have too. I thought if I fought hard enough, I could eventually be behind the front lines and have no worry about my struggles, like him. However, what I needed for the past 12 years was someone to be in the trenches with me, someone to say I wasn't alone in the fight and that they would fight with me. A quote popped into my head from Lord of the Rings of Two Towers. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered, full of darkness and danger they were, and sometimes you didn't want to know the end, because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? Same wise Gamgee. How could my world return to the way it was? It couldn't. I was finally seeing my dad for who he truly was. There was no turning back. Everything seemed to have shifted and it felt scary. What would come tomorrow and the day after? I didn't know. What I knew was that God had written the story and I could trust him with how it would play out. Michael's words stung but I couldn't argue with anything he'd said as his anger and disappointment had boiled to the top and overflowed into grace and forgiveness. Somehow, our honesty changed our relationship. Yes, we were still father and son, but we were also brothers who had ripped off our mask and become hot, letting each other see the truth. Chelsea had watched our discussion without comment, absorbing the emotions and realizing she would be marrying into a family that was undergoing significant turmoil but I could tell by her expression that she was fully engaged. Chelsea, how are you feeling? I'm sad for Michael and feel that if you had been honest earlier, maybe you could have helped him. He struggled so much, but I do forgive you. 
Her comments were spot on, and I could see she was already occupying the emotional position as Michael's wife, wanting to support him and do anything she could to assuage his pain. I nodded, realizing what she said was true. As our time came to a close, Michael and I embraced, lingering in our emotions, our bodies shaking with recognition of what God had done in the cleansing and bonding. I was thankful that Michael and Chelsea had received my words with mercy and compassion, not just with sadness. Being real and honest and taking off our mask was the hardest thing we've ever done with our kids. But it was Michael standing up, slamming his hand on the table, almost in protest, who let us know how damaging our hidden life had been. Yes, he'd also made wrong choices, but had we come to him earlier, maybe our transparency and humility would have lessened his struggles. After Michael and Chelsea left, Phil and I hugged and cried. We'd done the right thing, but that knowledge didn't make the process any less painful. We were planning to meet with Tim, our oldest, at his apartment on Friday afternoon. I had thoroughly enjoyed Tim's growing up years. We liked adventure, travel, and debating intellectual topics. When he was 15, I'd taken him on a weekend retreat in the Grand Tetons. There, I told him about my porn usage as a teenager. I desperately wanted him to be free from the shackles of this sin, but I hadn't felt I could tell him how I still struggled with porn. He'd listened, understood, and expressed appreciation for my disclosure. Over the years that followed, Tim had occasionally confided in me about his sexual temptations, and I had simply encouraged him that God would always provide a way of escape. Yet, I had been failing to take his way of escape from my struggles. In the days before my confession to Tim, those memories flooded back. There was no way to recover the past. I was where I was, and the only truthful way forward was through confession. Tim was in medical school and aggressively pursuing his education and striving for excellence. He had readily absorbed a lot of my constant instruction that had always pushed him to excel. I had frequently told my children, I abhor mediocrity, a mantra they would sometimes repeat while the rest of the family rolled their eyes. Tim had firmly taken the mantra to heart. He was sound and thorough in his thinking, always looking for reason and logic, while also knowing that God's plan for his life would be the only plan that could ever provide lasting satisfaction. I had very much wanted him to be sold out to God, and at the same time become a successful doctor. But in honesty, part of my hope for Tim's future had been that his success as a believer and a physician would be a testament to how great a father I'd been. What a bunch of crap. I had been so lost in my pride that I couldn't even see how out of balance I was in my hunger for admiration from others. Friday afternoon quickly arrived, and Priscilla and I went to Tim's apartment. He met us on the driveway, and moments later, we were all sitting together, Priscilla beside me and Tim to my right, facing me. I opened my journal, and the words communicated my emotion, my pain, and the brokenness my sin had brought into our lives. In the days after, Dad said he and Mom wanted to speak with me at my apartment. A funny feeling crept over me. I knew they had attended some conferences in the preceding weeks, but they hadn't told me the topic or purpose or what material was covered. They had only told me the topic covered bringing darkness to light, which hadn't helped narrow my frantic Google searches in the days leading to our sit-down. A different part of me was scared that the conversation would be an intervention rooted in their reservations about my girlfriend. We made brief, awkward small talk on the driveway when they arrived and I noticed my dad held a notebook and other materials. Once we were seated in my living room, dad began in his familiar business voice, the voice I'd heard him adopt on multiple occasions, his business meetings, teaching at church, and with car dealers, etc. His voice would take a commanding posture with matter-of-fact inflections and emotional distance. However, this time, his facade quickly crumbled when he glanced at the floor and his bottom lip began to quiver. Confusion washed over me as he fumbled with his notebook to find a specific page. What's going on? I've been unfaithful to your mom and our marriage vows. An emotional fog descended around me as I wrestled with confusion, sadness, shock, and fear. Minutes rolled by as my dad attempted to collect his emotions while reading his prepared confession. 
A tumultuous storm of emotions ensued. When I reflected on that afternoon, one other specific detail stood out in my mind. Dad looked up from the confession, emotionally spent and depleted of tears. With a trembling voice, fighting through feelings of failure and defeat, he asked for my forgiveness. He said he was sorry and had wanted to be a dad I would look up to and want to be like. A thought raced through my heart and out of my mouth. I do want to be like you. That stopped him in his tracks and he began to cry. I joined him, crying with my dad for the first time. This was not the same dad I'd known since childhood. This was a different man. Hours passed as the three of us talked about his sin, four days to freedom, and what God had been showing him. After they left, I felt a sense of sadness, pride, and fear. I was sad, having lost the ideal family I'd grown up in, and proud that my dad was experiencing radical transformation that displayed God's power in his life, which was what I wanted and expected to experience as well. I also felt fear that his openness would eventually require me to disclose the sexual sin I'd also been hiding for so long. As Tim and I talked in the months after my confession, our conversations became more open and honest as we confessed to each other our shortcomings and struggles. Several months later, Tim attended Four Days to Freedom, which further created a beautiful commonality in our relationship as adult men pursuing God's best for our lives. Tim's relationship with his girlfriend ended, and he eventually met Johanna, a wonderful woman who became not only his wife, but a battle partner and confidant much like Priscilla had become for me. I was so thankful for what God had done in Tim's life. Multiple blessings were sprouting from one act of obedience, confessing my sin, and I thought of the Apostle Paul's expression of praise to God from Ephesians 3.20. To him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. Finding time for Phil and me to talk with Sarah, our second-born, and her husband, Sean, would be challenging. They lived in Atlanta, a seven-hour drive from Orlando. Phil suggested we fly there and back the next Saturday, but I thought that would create anxiety and stress for Sarah and Sean as they tried to figure out why we were coming up for only a day. We decided to wait three weeks when they planned to be in Orlando for a special event with Sean's family. Knowing they had extensive plans with Sean's family for just about the whole time, I felt awkward asking Sarah for two hours of their time. Sarah was naturally inquisitive and would want an explanation about what we wanted to discuss. Nevertheless, I punched in her number and nervously waited for her to answer. Hey, Mama. Oi, tudo bem? I rattled off the traditional Portuguese greeting, meaning hi is all well. Talking to Sarah was a delight. We easily picked up conversation wherever we left off from the previous call. She responded with her typical, tudo bem. Although she didn't speak much Portuguese, it was nice that she had picked up words and phrases here and there, which always created a closeness I loved. Hey, um, I know you and Sean will be with his parents in a few weeks. Do you think you and Sean can give us two hours to talk? Sarah paused. Well, sure we can. What's going on? Just some things we really need to talk about. I was trying to be vague, but Sarah was a bottom line person like me, and her tone became persistent. Mom, what's going on? It would be better to talk face to face, I said. Okay, let me ask you something, Mom. Is someone dying? Are you getting a divorce? No, to both of these questions, I assured her. Okay, I can live with that. No problem. We'll see you soon and talk. I let out a sigh of relief as I disconnected the call. Funny how death and divorce are what weigh on people's minds no matter their age. Sarah was our first daughter and only 18 months younger than Tim. While Tim was most like me in terms of debating and delighting and having an answer to every question, Sarah was most like me in terms of presence and persuasion. In demanding settings, she showed poise and confidence while also expressing spiritual insight and tenderness. Sarah could sell anything, quickly persuading girls in high school to join the track and cross-country teams when no such teams had existed. She was beautiful like her mother and didn't mind being different from the crowd. Sarah viewed herself as the trendsetter, such as the time she had started wearing two different colored socks in elementary school. She was also eloquent and expressive. She could articulate her thoughts well without appearing stuck up or condescending. I admired her a great deal. 
I had never talked with Sarah about my porn addiction, not even what had happened when I was a teenager. I had felt I needed to protect her from everything, including boyfriends, and had seen myself as the shotgun-toting dad. I knew my discussion with her and Sean was going to be hard. The weeks passed quickly, and soon Sarah and Sean arrived. We exchanged hellos and pleasantries with the awkwardness of the elephant in the room. We all sat down, and Phil opened his journal and transparently shared his confession. For the first time, he was revealing his heart to Sarah and Sean. My father's face crumbled, and tears began to well up in his eyes when he started reading. I've not been faithful to your mother. I've broken my marriage vows to her. He hung his head, looking at his journal in his lap, and continued sharing, giving examples of exactly how he had broken his vows to mom. My mind reeled from the details, and my thoughts were a bombardment of questions and cries of disbelief. How is this possible? My dad's an elder in the church. He leads Bible studies. He was leading a double life all along? I tuned back in to listen more closely to the details. He shared about his first exposure to porn, and the details grieved me. I felt so sorry for him. He seemed almost like a sorrowful child. His confession was so genuine and sincere, with true brokenness and vulnerability I had never witnessed in him before. As his admission ended, my mind jumped to a confession that I heard earlier that week echoing a similar theme. My husband, Sean, had confessed to using porn and had shared his desire to go to counseling for the issue. We had discussed porn before, so his disclosure hadn't completely shocked me, though the details had been vague. I hadn't been overly concerned, but had been mostly pleased that he desired to put effort into fixing the problem. My reaction to Sean's recent confession had aligned with my religious spirit I hadn't been aware of until that week. In conversation with a friend, God had revealed to me that my relationship with him was built on my self-righteousness from pride. I had been in kind of a crisis of faith when I realized all my religious acts had been from an effort to earn the Lord's favor. I had no idea how to interact with him without trying to earn his love, so I had apathetically stopped trying. When my dad finished his confession, a few thoughts were highlighted in my mind. First was the divine timing of three revelations, Sean's confession, my realization of pride, and my dad's confession. Second, I realized what Sean and I needed in our marriage, openness, transparency, humility, and the realness of the Lord. Third, I still loved my dad, and I forgave him. I knew there would not be time for me and Sean to process all of this for another two days, though I desperately wanted to. Right after Dad's confession, Mom and I had to get on the road to travel an hour to a bridal shower with two male college-age Japanese students traveling with us. Yes, my tears flowed, and Mom allowed me space to process Dad's confession. Our concern regarding the two young men in the back seat fell aside as I told Mom how I was feeling. My whole life feels fake. All those picture-perfect family moments and experiences no longer felt so golden and shiny. I knew now what was really going on with the man behind the curtain, and I was crushed. As we arrived at the bridal shower, I dried my face and slapped on a band-aid smile to try to stop the hemorrhaging of emotions bursting from my soul. For the next few hours, I needed to pretend that my life was still golden and shiny. At the shower were some familiar faces among the many strangers who attended the bride and groom's church. How many of them are unfaithful to their wives? How many of them live a double life? How many are paying for sexual experiences? I assumed all of them. It was hard to be present, smiling, chit-chatting, while sharp accusations pierced my thoughts. I desperately wanted to process my dad's confession with Sean, but the weekend was packed with wedding events and sharing time between two families, so we'd agreed to put that conversation on hold until we had enough quality time to talk about it. We would have six and a half hours on our drive home to Atlanta. As we left Orlando, Sean and I finally had a chance to debrief together and process all that had happened over the weekend. We prayed and felt that we needed to confess to each other anything the Holy Spirit brought to our minds. They weren't all sin, but some were things we'd never mentioned to each other that had shame or guilt attached. Our new transparency shifted our interactions with the Lord and each other 
the Lord became so real to us, his presence with us in a way we had never experienced before. Finally, authentic with each other, we were fully known in a beautifully broken way. My dad's confession and true brokenness had changed the trajectory of our spiritual walk and our marriage. I had longed for a daddy-daughter relationship with Sarah like the ones portrayed in movies. The dad sacrifices all for his daughter, who lovingly rests her head on his shoulder. While Sarah and I had a good relationship, it operated more in a business fashion, me making sure she had everything she needed to be successful in life and her reaching out to me when she had problems. I knew we loved each other, but I wanted an emotional intimacy that would allow us to feel that daddy-daughter love rather than just acknowledge it. I had never suspected that my secret life was the barrier to obtaining the kind of relationship with my daughter that I longed for. In my desperation to hide my true self, I hadn't let anyone too close for fear they'd figure out who I really was. That wouldn't be pretty. So I kept my children at arm's length, pulling them in with one hand while holding up the other to protect them from my secrets. After my confession, everything changed in my relationship with Sarah. She leaned into me, and I into her, and I saw in her the beautiful, courageous, and wise woman God had blessed me with in a daughter, and now a beloved, intimate sister in Christ. Over time, our goodbye hugs were no longer perfunctory. We lingered in the arms of love, without barriers, not hiding our emotions, including our tears but instead reflecting the beautiful new way we now knew each other. My relationship with Sean also changed. For almost two years before Sean had married Sarah, I'd met with him for breakfast several times a month to get to know him and monitor how he and Sarah were doing. Even in our first meetings, I'd asked Sean whether he and Sarah were maintaining physical boundaries. I'd also asked about his history of using porn. I had been such a hypocrite. I had put him on the spot with tough questions while never owning up to how much sin I was hiding. I had feared Sarah would marry someone like me, so I had done what I could to reduce the risk. However, my posture had put Sean and me on two different levels. I had acted like a general and treated him as my subordinate infantryman in the trenches, just like I had treated Michael. After my confession, I apologized to Sean for how I had presented myself to him and the pressure I had put him under. He was gracious to forgive me, reflecting what God was doing in both of our lives. Several months later, Sean attended Four Days to Freedom, and we developed a closeness that encouraged us to be honest, open, and transparent with each other. A few weeks after Sean attended Freedom, he and Sarah called us about a confession he'd made. Sean shared with us, When I was at Four Days to Freedom, I asked the men in the group for their advice about something that had happened earlier in the year. Sarah and I were at a get-together, and a woman bent over the table in front of me, and I saw down her blouse. I wanted to see more, and took another look, then another, and a third. I asked the men at Four Days to Freedom if I needed to confess to the woman and her husband. The group kicked it around and concluded I didn't need to confess. They said she and her husband didn't know what I had done, and as long as I confessed to Sarah, that was enough. That makes sense to me, I said. You can't confess to every woman you see walking down the street. Sean continued, his voice wavering with emotion. Well, when I got home, I prayed about it and felt like the Lord wanted me to confess to the woman and her husband, so Sarah and I called them, and they joined us by speakerphone. I told them exactly what I had done and explained that God was doing something new inside me, and I asked for their forgiveness. They were astounded, surprised that I would call to confess my lustful thoughts. They were also very gracious and forgave me. Wow! Hearing Sean's experience, I was shocked. Even in my boldness to confess, I wasn't sure I could have done this. Sean continued, But you know, that confession created a special brokenness inside me. As I confessed, I began sobbing and continued to cry after we'd hung up. Sean, I'm amazed at your courage. Your brokenness is evidence that you heard from God, even when the counsel of all the men said otherwise. 
That's really amazing. I'm so proud of you. Sarah voiced her affirmation of Sean as well. It was clear that God had enabled her to be in a position of compassion and support for Sean. God's orchestration of events was amazing. Sean sharing his porn problem with Sarah and then Phil confessing his sin three days later. Although I had feared that exposing who we really were to Sarah and Sean would create distance, our transparency actually brought us closer together. Several months later, we asked Sarah and Sean to forgive us for being so judgmental and self-righteous during their dating relationship. Our sharing was an intimate time of transparency and healing. As for Anna, Hope, and Becca, we decided to meet with each of them separately. They were 11 and 9 years old, and I knew my confessions would need to be age-appropriate. We didn't want to exclude them, only for them to later learn our family secret and wonder why we had not told them earlier what had happened in our family. Secrecy had been my Achilles heel all along. We didn't want further secrecy in their lives. Although Anna, Hope, and Becca had similar beginnings in Chinese orphanages, they had very different personalities. Anna Hope was a year and nine months old when we received her from Changsha, China. She'd had a long journey on a train and bus to the adoption center. When the bus had arrived, the children had been quickly carried by their nannies across the lobby and into a room as we and other hopeful parents had watched. We'd received a few pictures of Anna Hope while we were still in the United States and strained to pick her out among 12 children being carried past us. One by one, a nanny called our family names. When we heard, Philip and Priscilla Fretwell, we jumped up, eager to hold our daughter for the first time. The nanny walked in with Anna Hope holding tightly to her. Priscilla instinctively reached out, but Anna Hope clung to the nanny who had to pry her off to put her into Priscilla's open arms. Anna Hope was crying, scared, and unsure of what was going on. When I stepped up, Anna Hope reached out to me and Priscilla let go. Anna Hope became like a little tree frog hanging on to me with all her might. She slowly stopped crying but didn't let go of me, and I couldn't put her down or give her to Priscilla for even a second. Somehow, Anna Hope had found in me the security she'd felt with the nanny. Instantaneously, I became her protector and provider. Her clinging to me continued for the next 10 days as we processed paperwork in China and got ready to return to the United States. Even on the plane, I held her the entire 30-hour trip. When I'd have to hand her to Priscilla to go to the bathroom, Anna Hope would cry until I returned. This newfound affection was foreign to me because our kids had always preferred Priscilla's embrace. But here was this small, scared, shy little girl relying on me, preferring me, and trusting me. I had loved it, and my soul had risen to the occasion. I had silently committed to defending and protecting her and never doing anything that would hurt her or destroy our relationship. Yet nine years later, looking into her soft brown eyes, I had to tell her I had not kept my promise. Three years after welcoming Anna Hope into our family, we had adopted Becca from an orphanage in Shenzhen, China. She was two years and nine months old, about two years younger than Anna Hope, and small for her age. While Anna Hope was calm and quiet, Becca was a fireball, fighting for her rights and survival while demonstrating an emotional joy for life that few could match. She hadn't cried when she had left her nanny. Over the years ahead, we had learned Becca was extroverted, emotional and loving, but also demanding and insistent on justice, fairness, and connection. She reacted quickly and emotionally to any sense of rejection, frequently saying, You just don't care. Somehow, God would have to show me how to expose my weaknesses to my little girl without making her feel like I just didn't care about her or her mommy. It was with these different personalities that my conversations began. It was important to me to be at eye level with the girls as they took their turns sitting on my big stuffed office chair, me on my knees and Priscilla by my side. I attempted to explain adult topics in a way I hoped could be understood by their child minds, and their reactions were similar. Their little eyes searched mine, trying to figure out what my explanations meant. They had come from a world of insecurity in China to a home of love and care. At least that was what they had thought. 
I could see in their faces a struggle to understand what my words meant to their security. The conversations went pretty much the same with each. I need to ask you for forgiveness for something I've done, I began. God created a special relationship between Mommy and Daddy when we got married, and we made special promises to always love each other. God allows mommies and daddies to have a special love for each other, and we promise not to love anyone else in the same way we love each other. Part of our love is that we feel good when we're hugging and kissing each other and sleeping together in the same bed, sometimes without our clothes. But this special relationship is only for mommy and me to share as husband and wife, and we promised each other we wouldn't be with anyone else in this way. The girls each nodded as though they understood, but I was unsure how much they were truly comprehending. I continued with prayer in my heart. Over the past several years, I didn't keep my promises to mommy. I broke my promises by being alone with other women, sometimes without my clothes on, and it hurt mommy a lot. I love mommy, and I don't love those other women. I apologize to Mommy for breaking my promises to her and hurting her, and Mommy has forgiven me. But I also know it hurts you to know I haven't loved Mommy the way I should. When a husband breaks his promises to his wife and brings other women into his life, the Bible calls this adultery. I knew my adultery confession would hit Anna Hope and Becca the hardest, but I needed to share more to create a base from which we could revisit this situation as they grew older into their teen years, dating relationships, and pre-marriage stages. Part of my problem was that I had been looking at pictures of naked women called pornography. Thinking about the pictures and sometimes touching my private parts made me feel good, but it made me not think about mommy. It was wrong of me to think about other women while touching my private area. That's called masturbation. Ugh. I couldn't believe I was explaining pornography and masturbation to my 11 and 9-year-old daughters. They each received my confession as simply information because their young minds could not yet attach the terms to shame and sin. Even though the confessions were shared with each daughter separately, both girls reacted about the same way, wide eyes brimming with tears. They understood enough to recognize I had shared a serious situation in which I had made wrong choices that jeopardized their security. Even at their young ages, they knew about divorce because they had seen how divorce had affected friends at school. Priscilla jumped in. But we want you to know that I have forgiven Daddy and we aren't getting a divorce. They nodded, and we could see the relief in their eyes. They each reached up to hug me, quickly saying they forgave me too. I felt a sense of relief and was glad I had established the base so our future conversations wouldn't contain new and shocking information. Seeing Phil confess to each of our children created mixed feelings in me. One minute, I'd want him to carry through with the confessions, But the next minute, I'd question whether we were doing the right thing. As we proceeded, we found that the confessions changed everything to better our family relationships, our family image now freely authentic, and how our children thought about their parents. Seeing Phil experience with our children some of the same rawness I felt was therapeutic for both of us. With each confession to our children, I saw Phil's heart ripped out, shredded, and put back together again. He felt the tearing and the anguish as I did each time he delivered a confession. In that strange sort of way, Phil had decided to join me in my soul's pain, bringing us closer together. We couldn't have known how our children would react. They each asked different questions, processing in their own way the wound to their security. They each forgave their father and embraced the relationship that remained, though newly tattered and frayed. In the months that followed, Anna Hope and Becca each showed an interest in not only rebuilding their relationship with their dad, but making it truly honest, open, and transparent. It was a true picture of grace.
Over the next several years, Anna Hope and Becca were always included in our hot family discussions about our story and how God was using our transformation to positively impact the lives of other couples, their marriages, and their families. Four years later, when Anna Hope and Becca were 15 and 13, we revisited the specifics with them, making sure we had answered all their questions and that they understood God's plan for honest, open, and transparent communication, personal sexuality, purity, and covenant marriage relationships of purity. We were glad we had openly included them in our prior family discussions over the past four years. They had seen all the couples in and out of our home who had asked us to meet with them about their marriages. So when we broached the subject in their teens, it wasn't a surprise to them. They listened attentively, showing curiosity and asking questions to understand better what had happened in our marriage and how to process the truth. The hot environment Anna Hope and Becca had grown up in encouraged them to openly ask questions regarding their own sexuality. Being honest, open, and transparent with our children created communication that's rare between parents and their children. Our openness fostered a culture of safety and vulnerability for Anna Hope and Becca to discuss topics frequently hidden from parents. Priscilla and I often reflected on how unusual this environment was and how our confessions to our two young daughters years prior had created a comfortable foundation for communication. The girls could share their most intimate thoughts and questions without hesitation or embarrassment. The freedom God had shown me and Priscilla reflected in our children's lives, giving us hope they would be protected from the potential shame that affects so many teens about sexuality and from secrets that lead to destruction. As this part of our story came to a close, I took a deep breath. We had made it through the most intimidating part of Phil's action plan. I didn't know the confessions would serve merely as a primer for what was to come. God had much more he wanted to do in Phil's heart and life and mine. Although we had dealt with the current sin, other wounds and shame from our past were yet to be revealed. Savage Questions for Reflection Number 1. How did your family of origin treat secret sins? How has it affected you? Number two, have you ever been hurt because of someone else's secrets? What happened and how did it make you feel? How did the aftermath affect you? Number three, what secret areas of your life have you not shared with your spouse? Why haven't you shared them? Are you willing to take a step toward becoming hot with your spouse about these secrets? Number four, what messages do you want to send to your children about the effects of secrecy? How can you share these with your children? This is Phil and Priscilla Fretwell. Thanks for listening. Our book, Savage Marriage, Triumph Over Betrayal and Sexual Addiction, is now available on Amazon. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Savage Marriage Ministries. Also, join our Savage Marriage community at SavageMarriageMinistries.com. And remember, it's God who is at work in your savage adventure.